Hey, everybody, coming to you live from across the country of Canada. <laughs> We're back for a, another Have a Chat. Um, so you'll see some familiar faces here if you tuned into the last Have a Chat. But if not, um, I'm Anne LeMessure, and I'm the Managing Director here at the Fundraising Lab. And I'll pass it on to Kathy to introduce herself. I'm Kathy Mann, President of the Fundraising Lab. Uh, Steph. I'm Stephanie McGregor, and I'm a senior associate at the Fundraising Lab. And I'm Erin Boyce. I'm the digital and data manager for the Fundraising Lab and the newest staff member. Hey. Right on. <laughs> so we're coming together to just chat about issues that pop up in our day-to-day -day work with our clients and internally here at the Fundraising Lab. And we're talking about something that is very top of mind right now, which is direct marketing. And as we're getting into the end of the year giving season, we are talking to clients, hearing from clients with questions or concerns or just all the focus right now is on that end of year campaign. Um, as we know in our sector, it is the busiest time of year for individual gifts and everyone is really sort of racing to that December 31st date and racing to get their appeals out the door. Um, and I think that's something that we all have some experience with here at this table um, is that that push to, to get your, your holiday or end of year giving appeal out. And so with that in mind, sort of being the theme of the conversation, I'm just going to pose the question of where have we seen clients or get stuck or like where have we been stuck when it comes to this sort of crucial time of year? Um, and yeah, whoever wants to sort of jump in, go, go for it. Uh, well, I'll start. Um, so I think the, the two things that um, I see are um, uh, we don't get to it soon enough. So it pushes things out. And I know there's more conversation to be had about that. But I think the other thing is just um, uh, getting a little bit stuck about what story to tell. So you don't think about it um, far enough in advance, which means suddenly you're in September or October and you're like, I have a direct marketing campaign that I have to put together. Um, and so I guess my, the thing that I, that I would ask people to really think about is to early in the year, start thinking about who's going to be the signatory so that you can, you can take those steps to make sure that you're reaching out to that person so that you can, when you're ready to do the writing, that person is already teed up because that can slow you down. Um, a whole lot if you don't know who uh, who's actually uh, writing, not writing a lot, but who, whose story is is being uh, shared. Mm, I think that's an interesting piece to talk about a little bit more because when you mean the signatory, that's the person whose perspective the story is being told from, or they're, they're the ones who are signing off on the letter. And some organizations do this and some don't. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about that, Kathy, and what you've seen. Yeah, and so I think just because we're we're in the fall and and we know that what's we're coming up to a a direct marketing uh, season that uh, that is sort of pre-holiday, um, what we often see in this time of the year is is um, letters written from the perspective of somebody who has either you know received um, supports or services from a client or. Um, or a staff or a volunteer to talk about the work of the, of the organization. Um, and uh, I think that storytelling is so incredibly powerful that my advice is tell stories. Don't just have the letter come from the perspective of your executive director or a board member um, sort of reporting back. There is a role for that kind of letter, and I like to do that at the beginning of the year or a spring letter where it's kind of like state of the union, here's all the great stuff that we did last year, and that can really come from an executive director. But at this time of the year, I really encourage people to tell stories um, about um, uh, somebody who has benefited from the work that you do. And, you know, I think about... Um, not every organization has human clients. Sometimes they have the environment, sometimes they have animals, um, but you can always position it as a story. So if it's an, an organization that deals with animals, 
I mean, you see lots of them telling the story from the perspective of the animal, but you can also tell the story from the perspective of a human who loves an animal, right? So a pet owner or somebody who appreciates animals that are, you know, endangered. Um, but yeah, it's the, it's the power of storytelling that um, I really encourage people to, uh, to incorporate into their letters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always find it effective when you're reading someone's story and it sounds like it really is from their point of view with like, I don't know, quotes or sayings that that just sound so unique that they couldn't sort of be fabricated. And I think images accompany it. Like I've seen some organizations that we've worked with um, use like a landing page on their website that if you receive a letter in the mail or if you receive sort of the emails that might accompany it, sort of have an image of the signatory on the the landing page and it just sort of ties it all together and I don't know I really I think that's a, a great sort of complementary piece yeah I, I think so too and um and further to that I mean if you've got any social media accounts you can actually um plan for if you've got a calendar you're just you know doing it on the fly um tying that message and that story into whatever social accounts that you have uh, whether it's you know you know Facebook or Twitter or or Instagram and so looking to to capture even some of smaller messages so you can create multiple posts over time drive them all to the landing page. Mm. I think that that 360 degree perspective um, you know is how we transitioned from direct letters to direct marketing and it's so important now to you know, yes, the letter is important, but also what happens before the letter, what happens after the letter, um, you know, what follow-up is there, have we done any teasers, um, are we building up um, our audience to feel receptive to that, um, and whether or not the audience is primed for it might make a difference to their response. Mm, yeah, I think that's a, a great point. I think we, we've all had some experiences with audiences that whether we've primed them enough or not, or maybe we haven't segmented the data enough or not, they've received possibly the wrong letter or the wrong message that we didn't want to for them to receive, which is, I mean, it's a learning experience at the end of the day. And um, Kathy and I always sort of battle between what's more important. Is it the, the data and the segmentation or the great content that might be in the letter? Um, but yeah, like what do you do if your letters end up in the wrong hands or the wrong segment sort of goes to the wrong person? I wonder if anyone has experienced that. I've definitely seen that play out um, where someone who wasn't meant to receive a certain copy of the letter where um, donors and recipients of services were kind of an intermingled group. And, um, you know, if you have a sensitive topic or an emotional topic, um, that maybe uh, if you're, you know, you want, you want your story to be impactful. And if you're telling your truth, the truth about what your organization does, um, I think that that's the ultimate goal. But that truth isn't always comfortable for everyone. So if they get the wrong letter, um, they might have a pretty visceral response and you might hear from someone or you get somebody who unsubscribes uh, to your newsletter or something like that. And um, I guess that that is one of those risks, um, especially if you have multiple touch points, right? It's not just the letter, it's also email follow-up and it's also social media posts. And what does that look like for someone who maybe just gets triggered by something? Um, for sure, I've, I've had experiences trying to, you know, uh, really speak to donors who just felt overwhelmed by what they received. Hmm. So I think uh, I have a couple of thoughts about this. One is that um, we in our sector tend to not want to upset anybody. Um, and we in our sector work oftentimes in causes that are upsetting, right? And so somehow we want to strike this balance where we're telling the story of the work that we do that is sometimes about upsetting stuff without upsetting anybody. And so um, those two are pretty hard to, uh, to, to, to match up. I remember years ago before I was in fundraising, a friend of mine um, uh, was watching TV one night and he complained bitterly to me because there was a United Way campaign 
uh, commercial. And he said, I don't want to see that kind of stuff when I'm eating dinner in front of the TV after a hard day at work. <laughs> and I remember having seen that United Way commercial. And at the time I worked at frontline uh, stuff. And I was like, oh, what an amazing commercial. They're actually telling the real story of, of the kind of work that, that we do. And so we're never going to please everybody. And I think one of the things that we need to be really mindful of is that, to your point, Aaron, if you're telling your truth um, and you've been um, you know, thoughtful, as thoughtful as you can be around sensitivities, um, then you just have to be prepared to like chat with people, respond with people, um, and, and uh, uh, like be a little bit unapologetic. And like, yeah, this is the work that we do and we want people to understand what's really happening. I think Kathy, you once, once said to me that, you know, if, if you get a, a really emotional response to something, it means they care about the cause too, which is, that's not a bad thing. No, we don't wanna make people uncomfortable. But if, if we're evoking a response, then, you know, maybe on some level, depending on the situation, we've actually done something right. Yeah, I mean, people who care, you know, <laughs> typically the people who re reach out to you really care about the, the, the organization. Um, typically, sometimes they just have maybe more time on their hands than, uh, than, than others do. But that is such an opportunity. If somebody cares enough to reach out, that is an opportunity to engage with that person. And um, it may deepen the relationship. It might simply be that they said their piece and they don't want to have anything more to do with you. But, you know, I think our, our responsibility is to, um, is to talk with people, um, hear them out, um, and, uh, and, and do what we can to... Um, state our case. Hmm. One thing that I sometimes see with our clients is that they have particular donors who've made it clear that they do not want to be solicited and that they, they will give their annual gifts or they'll give on their terms, but they don't want to receive um, any solicitations. But what inevitably happens is that maybe there's been a database migration and the data wasn't clean or someone didn't tick the no solicitation box or that information didn't get pulled into the data pull and that donor receives the letter. And I mean, from my perspective, if you have the amount of sort of, if you have time and resources available, it would be really looking through your, the list that's going to be sent to the mail house or if you're doing the mailing in-house really sort of combing through that list and seeing if you can recognize any of those names. Um, but that's a common issue that, that we see all the time. And sometimes it's because there's a donor relations person or volunteer who might have been taking that call and not getting that information into the database. And so while that donor did make their case known, the, the data wasn't tracked. And so it's just another sort of touch point to look in your database to see if you have a um, a yes or no solicitation box and, and if that's even being pulled into your data when it's going to the mail house. So I, uh, oh, go ahead. Steph. Sorry, Kathy. Um, I was going to say that, uh, you know, I'm glad you turned it to data because data is king. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I remember one of the organizations I worked with, we had been given like a historical database and there were like 7,000 names mm -hmm. on it. And so when I arrived, I was like, okay, well, we have to get to the work of like cleaning this mm -hmm. because, you know, as you, as you said before, if, if our data is not clean, then our results won't be what they need to. And we may be getting calls, Aaron, mm -hmm. like you said, around, you know, people who are upset or um, people who maybe have passed on our list or organizations that sh just shouldn't be on the list. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you said that because um, we sometimes work with clients for who for whom um, a, a really robust direct marketing campaign might be the might be their first time doing it in the way that we support them through it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you've not tested the data, if you haven't mailed or emailed to, to some of the folks on your data, um, you're not going to know if that the information is all correct. And so if you're 
new to it and your uh, and your data is um, untested, which is not a great term, but you know if you haven't if you haven't reached out to folks on your database, um, you might get a whole lot of responses. And the <laughs> typical things we see is people have have uh, died and uh, we haven't either learned about that or updated the records. Um, people, lots of email or uh, address changes that you just update. Um, and there might be some people who have reached out and asked you to not solicit them. And like Anne said, we didn't update it. So be prepared in those early days um, to respond um, and to um, be gracious and you know apologetic if you've if you've messed up. The mm -hmm. truth is, data is a journey. We're not always going to get it right, and uh, and you have to be prepared to to live with the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. And Steph, I have such sympathy for that that story because you know if you're if you're starting from a pool of seven thousand uh, contacts, um, the hours uh, and time that is required, mm -hmm. especially if you haven't recently done some kind of um, mail out or or direct uh, marketing is just astronomical to organize those to segment them and that is one of the reasons that it that it you know it sounds okay we're going to send a letter we're going to do some social media it sounds kind of like simple but it's so complex and it, it takes so much nuance to get that data to a place where the letter and the social media and the emails can be successful mm -hmm. And the, there's another sort of piece where it's like once you're in the midst of the campaign and you're sending out sort of the letter and the emails, and then the donations start to come in, but you're continuing to send out emails. It's like making sure that you're not sending, if if someone's donated, that they're not receiving additional solicitations that imply that they haven't donated. So it's, it's very, I think like there, you can do so much with a direct marketing campaign that like you want to make sure that all those pieces are lined up, but you also have to be realistic about your resources. And like, if you can send, like Aaron mentioned, a couple of primer teaser emails and then like a last call email, that's still better than, than nothing. So I think it's also recognizing limitations and trying to put like caveats in the email. If like, if you've already donated, we thank you so much. Is usually um, helps a little bit, but you'll still likely get those those sort of complaints um, if um, if a donor feels so inclined. I, th I think, I think uh, oh, <laughs> Kathy, now it's your turn. <laughs> All right, I think it's um it's worth um, just talking about those complaints and how to manage your executive director if you're not the executive director. Um, I certainly have had uh, an executive director say we're never doing this again um, mm -hmm. because we got um, three complaints. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this was early in my career and we actually had a fundraising consultant who was supporting me. And I called her, oh, what are we gonna do? The director, <laughs> ED says, and you know, she talked me off the ledge. Um, she ended up talking with the executive director and me together, but her point was, and I have delivered this message so many times now, um, how many letters did you send out? And at that time we had actually sent out a hundred thousand letters <laughs> and how many complaints did you get? Three. <laughs> so <laughs> like just understand the ratio and how much, and how many have responded positively and given you uh, donations. And so it's understanding that. And we have this bias about like this negativity bias, right? We, mm -hmm. we give more weight to things that are negative uh, than that are to positive. And so it's it's really understanding that and being able to deliver that message internally if you've got folks who are um, upset about um, uh, about any of the feedback that you're getting. Mm -hmm. It always frustrates me that there seems to be like such a double standard between the sort of for-profit world sending multiple messages versus the nonprofit world. And I mean, I could open up my email now. I'm not one of those zero inbox people. I have like an inbox of like 7,000 unread emails from like Lululemon or whatever company that the, like I ended up on their email list that emailed me multiple times a day and more if I start clicking through it and looking at products, right? They're retargeting. And donors don't exist in like a vacuum where they're not receiving the same type of emails. Like they're getting targeted from all angles from every company that they're on email list for. So 
I just have sort of a frustration with the way that nonprofits who have so many less like resources are held to such like a higher standard when it comes to this. So anyway, if any donors are listening, cut us some slack. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, so and it's catch twenty two, right? We're held to a higher standard. We don't that we there's this expectation that we don't want to bother people. Um, mm -hmm. but by the same token, um internally, there's an expectation that we raise money to do the incredible work that we're doing. Um, so it is um, uh, yeah, it's a it is a difficult position to be in. Mm -hmm. So any last words of advice or support as um our audience embarks in their end of year giving period? I was, I was just going to add in, we've talked about a lot. We've talked about, you know, clean data. We've talked about possibly segmenting lists. We've talked about letters and emails and social media. And uh, I think probably if, if uh, people uh, want to do this, that developing a critical path, as we term it, uh, as the term that we use is, is going to be very helpful because it, it's like, oh, I've got to do everything at once, but you actually sit and plan it out on a calendar. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, my last piece of advice is that um, we have some resources already in Spark about um, how to do some of these things. So there's a masterclass about how to write a direct mail letter. There's some stuff about how to write a thank you letter. So there are some component pieces that um, if you're new at this, you can um, you can get some support. I'll just add that um, if you're pulling data to look in those fields that you might not have considered before, maybe you have a solicitation field with a yes, no option where donors potentially have said that they don't want to be solicited or notes, even like the notes on a donor might have this information. So um, I would recommend if you're doing a data poll to pull those fields in to look at them and they might help you exclude some, some folks. <laughs> That's it. Aaron, any last words of advice or support or encouragement? <laughs> just, just to to give yourself some um, grace, uh, whether you're staff or volunteer or even just a donor who cares about the cause. Um, remember that everybody's kind of trying their best to to reach out um, to to sort of highlight the good work that's being done and to make it possible to keep going. And that um, at this time of year, yes, there you know, there's lots floating around and there's lots of appeals but um but that um so long as you're doing your best you're probably going to come out the other side um glad that you put in the effort nice that's a great note to end on thank you Erin and thanks everybody uh for listening and tuning in we will see you next time <laughs>